want to just point out that there is something, and with that something, we can actually then ask, can we explain some basic facts about consciousness in the brain, which are worth knowing, okay? Facts like, I told you before, this is a scan of a brain in action, an active human brain. This is the cerebral cortex. This is done like this. And this is the cerebellum. They're both active. Whatever you do, they all do all kinds of stuff. They are complicated machines. But as I told you, the cortex matters. In fact, some parts, especially in the back, matter. The cerebellum doesn't matter at all, even though it has five times more neurons. Or this. I've been studying consciousness and sleep forever. In sleep, early in the night when you fall asleep, you cease to exist. If I wake you up, we've done it on hundreds of subjects in the lab. They come out, and regularly they say, I wasn't anywhere. I come out of nowhere. There was nothing before. That's the usual thing we get, OK? So there was nothing. And their brain, however, is not shutting off at all. It's just as active and when they are awake. So you need to explain that, OK? That's one of these basic facts. If you don't understand that, you understand nothing. Or this is a seizure. When a person has a generalized seizure and they fall down and they shake like this, for instance, they lose consciousness, but the neurons become even more active. So why? These are the kind of questions we can actually address and test the theory that way. And the theory, for instance, can explain very well why these parts of the cerebral cortex, indicated here, can support consciousness. It's because more than anything else in the known universe, they are incredibly integrated, tightly interconnected, nothing like it. And that's exactly the recipe that IAT, the theory says, is needed to be conscious. Conversely, the cerebellum, despite its huge number of neurons, is like a bad modular society where nobody talks to anyone. They all are little modules that do their job, and they talk, talk to each other. By the way, maybe in this audience, maybe worth mentioning, especially in many years past, I was making the case, here I only have two examples, but that the right anatomy, the right connectivity for consciousness, this one, is tight interconnections among specialists. People, so to speak, these are neurons, that do different things but do it together, very closely integrated, like a good community. Modular, everybody on his own, not good at all. If everybody is connected to everyone without specialization, they all obey the same orders, that's a totalitarian society, that's terrible too. Okay? So it's just an interesting thing. To be conscious, you need the right kind of organization. Okay. So, and then the other thing, just to mention it, is I told you that even if you have the right anatomy, if you fall into dreamless sleep, you lose consciousness. So why is that? The theory explains it very well. It says that it is because the causal interactions within this densely interconnected part are lost that you are lost. And indeed, when we go, this is work we did going inside the brain of epileptic patients so we can record the interactions. Won't explain how, but in essence, you see that while the neurons are active, they don't talk to each other anymore. They cannot really affect each other well, and that's when consciousness is lost. We can also explain why it feels the way it does, why space feels extended, as I told you, and ultimately, you know, why time feels flowing, and so on and so forth. All of this can be understood now properly based on the way some parts of the brain are organized, how the neurons are connected, if you have the proper understanding of what consciousness is. And I close here with a very, very brief introduction of what the theory can and wants to do. I'll move on to a little bit of what you can use the theory for, not for explanation, but for prediction. That is, can we actually make predictions and test those two in a way that's novel and that can actually help us even in diagnosing consciousness disorders, as you will see? And the answer is yes. We've been doing this for many years now. That was the first study. We used transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a way to knock on your brain without going in. And then we record with electroencephalography, the reverberations of the activity of the cerebral cortex. And in short, if these reverberations are complex, like this, and they go all over, it is consistent with high integrated information, this quantity phi. So when you're conscious, that should be the case, and that's what we found. Whereas if you, same subject, fall deep into sleep, dreamless sleep early in the night and consciousness is lost, 
the brain is still there, the connections are still there, the neurons are still firing, but when you knock on the brain, you get a very stereotypical local response, just as predicted by the theory. And this now can be exploited in developing tools to accurately measure consciousness, which is something we sorely need, because believe it or not, until now, the way to know whether somebody is conscious or not is to ask them. <laughs> and if they answer, we conclude, well, they are. And if they don't answer, then all bets are off. Okay? But keep in mind that we ask Chad GPT, they always have an answer for us, and a very articulate one to boot. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Well, most patients can't even begin to answer, but they may be there. And this is why this is clinically very relevant. We transform this into essentially a way to get a number out of the complexity of the responses of the brain when you knock on it, based on the theory. And if this number is high, we can conclude that the person is there, whether or not that person can respond. So they may not be able to say anything, they may not be able to move, they may not be able even to move their eyes. But if we knock and get that complex response, we are now basically sure the person is there. And that's very important because in vegetative patients who have been there maybe for months or years sometimes, you don't really know. And we now know that roughly up to 40%, between 20 and 40% are conscious. And so that's, of course, where you should concentrate efforts for rehabilitation and so on. Not only there, a very, very important aspect is in the intensive care unit. So I've learned it rather recently, I must say, that it's up to 80% in this country of people who have brain trauma, for instance, or cardiac arrest. And in the first two weeks after they get to the ICU, they actually very often have a withdrawal of care decision made. So they are unconscious or rather unresponsive. And then it's decided that, you know, since we don't know better, okay, 80% withdrawal of care. Now, we're, we're trying to, you know, get essentially this kind of machine into the ICU and see whether we can actually tell the person is there despite the fact there are no responses to help in make informed decisions and also prognostically because if you are conscious, it's very clear that you're much more likely to then get out of the state of unresponsiveness. There are other experiments, many more. I'll just quote, you know, one to you. For instance, we can do something very simple that had not been done. We can compare brain activity when you are dreaming, which is a kind of consciousness. You have experiences. You see stuff. Last night, I dreamt of skiing. You know, so evidently, there is something of the environment here that helped me. <laughs> it, it, I dreamt of other things, too, that I won't tell you, but it was a great, great <laughs> dream. Okay, so I dreamt of all of that. And uh, you know, that was being heavily conscious, but disconnected from the environment, compared to when the subjects are completely gone, so they are not there early in sleep. And when you compare it, you find these areas in green and blue, this posterior part of the cortex back here, those are the areas that if you are dreaming, they are just fine. If you lose consciousness, so you have dreamless sleep, the causal interactions inside, as I mentioned to you before, break down because there is this called delta activity, which essentially means the neurons cannot talk to each other well. So we showed that. And the nice thing is this is, you're still sleeping, so outwardly you are there, sleeping, eyes closed, doing nothing, the brain looks the same, does the same things, but no, as predicted, that's what happens in the brain. And one last piece of experiments before closing with the last part. This is something we worked on for the past four years, and it has to do with a very counterintuitive prediction of IIT. IIT says, because of what it says consciousness is and what it takes to have it, it says that you can also be conscious if the neurons in the appropriate part of the cortex here in the back primarily are fine, but they are not active at all. As long as they are fine and they can interact, even though they are not firing, meaning spiking, shouting, whatever you want to call it, you still would be conscious. And I thought that in many traditions, especially spiritual tradition, both Buddhist, Zen, but also some Christian traditions, there are some states that have been called states of pure presence, or sometimes pure awareness, naked awareness, there are different names, but they essentially refer to the same state of consciousness. It's the state in which the subject is vividly there, so there is something it is like to be, 
But there are no thoughts, no object, you're not seeing stuff or hearing stuff, no self. It's not you, there's just existence. Okay? And usually it's described like a vast luminous expanse. That's how they describe it. And we now study many of these from different traditions. And we predicted that what we would find is that in the brain, you find that activity is minimal. And that's exactly what you see here. This gamma activity we recorded with EEG. This is just the surface of the brain projected down. The details don't matter. Is usually reflective of neurons being very active. And when you are in this state here, the neurons are minimally active. We can't really record them. We can't go inside until we find an epileptic meditator, which we haven't found yet. But there is almost no activity in the brain, and consciousness is there. This is against every scientific notion that you know, people think it's information process. So all of this brings me to the last part, which is some of the implications. Given that this theory explains a lot about consciousness and has been tested, and so far, definitely so good, okay? If we take its lead, where do we go in asking difficult questions like animal consciousness, organoid, collective consciousness, and above all, artificial consciousness, okay? And I want to mostly focus briefly on artificial consciousness because it's becoming urgent and important. So many, most of my colleagues in neuroscience, psychology, cognitive neuroscience, and also most philosophers do think that future robots or even just computers running very powerful AI, since they're going to do all the things we can do, they're going to be as conscious as we are. What else is there after all? That's what I think, okay? So because they do all we do, they would feel all we do, whatever that means. They have no explanation for what that means. But IAT clearly indicates, and we have demonstrated that, that you may have a system which is functionally equivalent. So a computer, for instance, that does everything you do, properly programmed, driven by AI. But because of the way it's built, because of how computers are organized, doesn't matter what the software is, they will not be able to support this big phi structure and therefore be conscious. In fact, there will be zero consciousness. They will disintegrate into many, many, many things that count for nothing that I call ontological dust. Okay, that's what I call them. So it's nothing. They act as if they were like you or better than you, but there is absolutely nothing there, which is what many people, I think, rightly intuit, but all the experts think otherwise, okay? And so to quote Philip Larkin, okay, what is it like to be a computer? No sign, no sound, no touch, or taste or smell, nothing to think with, nothing to love or link with. Okay, so he was very perceptive. He wasn't talking about computers, though. And that leads to a dissociation, which we should be very well aware of, between conscience and intelligence. IT says that you can have incredible intelligence, and we're beginning to witness that, and no consciousness whatsoever. There's nobody there. It's dust. You can also have potentially high consciousness, I'm indicating an organoid there, but in an organoid in certain conditions that we don't do in the lab, okay? Which might be conscious, at least of space or something like that, and stupid, do nothing, not be capable, doesn't even have inputs and outputs, for instance, okay? The place where you can find conscious and intelligence go together is actually through evolution, is for a story which I won't be able to tell you today, if the forces that make, you know, you have to be conscious, fine, but also be able to survive in the environment, then the two things go together, which is why we are both conscious and intelligent, usually, but not always. 